Hey everyone and welcome to Black Canvas TV. I hope you're all doing really well. So today we are going to be talking about the representation of black women in the UK. I think the title pretty much speaks for itself, but we did another casting call again to get the opinions of a diverse set of women because we want to talk about what does it mean when we say representation? Is representation enough? Going to talk about respectability politics we're going to talk about how representation impacts the younger generation we're also going to talk about how being the only one the token black in a space can also be quite stressful and also can come with its own pressures and fears when you feel like you have to represent your entire race so as always i hope you enjoy the conversation if you're not already following us on all of our socials they will be on the screen right now use the hashtag black canvas tv to follow along with the conversation i hope you enjoy Hi everyone, how's everyone doing? Good, good, good. Doing good. good. Yeah. Morning, good. Day, looking moisturized, looking fresh, <laughs> looking black. <laughs> and looking strong. Um, so, <laughs> black women and representation. So, representation is something that like gets spoken about a lot, you know, how we're represented. And look, again, a lot of the time as well, there are certain intersections as well that get left out of the conversation. So, I'm going to throw this out to anybody who would like to go first. When we say representation, what does that mean to you? What do we mean by representation? I think for me, it means somebody who I can identify with. So whether that's in the way that they look, maybe their socioeconomic class, maybe what they're studying, their family makeup, like how can I identify with them? Like what do I see that kind of represents me and represents myself? So for me, that would probably be like the general, the general gist. Mm -hmm. Would everyone agree with that? Yeah. 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 Okay. So one of the things that I feel like I've noticed, so I grew up in the 90s and I feel like in the 90s, there was a lot of representation personally. I feel like the only thing is that it was obviously a lot of US representation. So like you had Sister Sister, One on One, Fresh Prince, Girlfriend. There was a lot of TV that, you know, and again, I also had Nollywood as well. Like I'm Nigerian, so I had Nollywood. So, you know, you did have a lot. For some reason, I feel like that has declined. And I feel like we've kind mm. of gone a little bit backwards. And I just wanted to get your thoughts. Why do you think that is? Um, Simone, you got your hand up. Well, I think that's quite interesting that you say that because um, I, was, I was brought up a little bit before the 90s. I'm not going to expose myself how far back. Well, OK, I was raised in the 70s. So let me be honest. Well, what was you. it like in the 70s? Oh, my God. It, it was like such um, a lovely time. <laughs> well, I had my first son mm -hmm. in the 90s. So definitely when you're saying what you're saying, I'm like, oh, OK, maybe I'm a bit old here. But yeah, what I would say is. I actually don't think we had a huge representation. All those shows that you seem to have mentioned actually were cable TV and that was imported in from the US. So the US has always had the representation, but the UK, I don't think we particularly did because I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but what British show did you just mention? Yeah, that was my point. <laughs> It was, so, it was very US centric. Yeah, mm. and it was just, mm. it was just almost like, I remember actually visiting the, U the US in like the, the 90s and seeing like adverts and it was black women and it was creams and it was toothpaste and it was all very standard. But I don't, I don't think we've ever, ever really had that. And whenever they have put us in the media and you think back to shows that they were out, they were actually derogatory. And they was, we were always like, the dumb character, or I love Desmond, but they were lazy black men that were hanging around in a barber shop all the time, you know? Mm. So personally, I don't think we've ever really been represented right in the media here thus far. That's just how I feel. But no, that's a good, that's a good point. So then that kind of raises the question that, you know, is there a right or wrong way to represent us? Because yes, yeah, fine, it may not have been what you would have liked to see, but it was there. So is there a right or wrong way to represent us in the media? I'm gonna to go to, to Nana. Um, yeah, because I think like that it goes down to respectability politics, doesn't it? Because there are black people are not a monolith. There are different types of black people. So even today when we have a lot of, you know, films that are like about gang violence and stuff like that, that's cool. You can have those stories, but it's also about having different stories because we are different people. We have different backgrounds, we have different, upbringing so it's just about 
having a wide range of representation more so. So it's just not enough representation, I think, was the problem and still is the problem today. Mm -hmm. Nima? Yeah, um, you said, sorry, I'm just trying to remember exactly what you said, but you said something along the lines of, um, is it a case of not having the right representation, but the fact was that we were there. And I'm obviously black and Muslim, which for me is there, is, there really isn't an and, but um, for most people when they see me, it's a black and Muslim thing. And when I think of Muslim representation, I'm very rarely included. You rarely see black Muslims, unless it's a black Muslim actor who's just acting, you know, a character and therefore they're not black and Muslim you know, they're not presenting as black and Muslim, they're just presenting as the character they're acting. And when I think about Muslim representation and I think about what it has been like for Muslims in the past, however many years in the media, it's either been the terrorist thing or the inclusive Muslim who throws her headscarf off at the first sign of a white man thing. It's very much, they're telling your story for you. And so when I come into place, I remember having actual black Nigerian friends who I'm also West African go, oh, I thought you are Indian because for some reason it's just never existed for them in their mind and I think that plays to it that once someone else starts telling your story for you you no longer exist that yeah that's yeah when somebody else tells <laughs> the story for you you no longer exist it's a really important point Mariam um actually I came to say my point so I put my hand down but what I was going to say um is that we often afford white people the chance to have so many different types of stories put out. So if you think about EastEnders, Hollyoaks, um, even going back to like Brookside and Family Affair, and then we think of Downton Abbey and we think of The Crown and we think, do you know what I mean? There's so many different ways that white people get to tell their stories. So as much as growing up for me, it was very, very American um, the representation, but for me, there was still representation, I guess. The argument then is to say if you didn't have cable so cable is definitely a privilege for some of us mm -hmm. right so if you didn't actually get cable growing up what were you seeing outside of that so when people say we didn't have British population I definitely get that I definitely understand because not everybody had cable mm -hmm. yeah. yeah good point um, yeah um, yeah I, I really agree with what's already been said and I also grew up in the 90s and I think there was some level of representation, as we mentioned, in terms of like Desmond's and the real McCoy. And as we moved into the noughties, there was a real push towards like multiculturalism. And that was kind of the buzz, especially in the UK. And I think there was kind of a bit more like we saw more black faces and adverts and extenders and things like that. But it was always paired with whiteness. For example, you'd always see an interracial couple or a biracial family. So it was kind of as if the only palatable version of blackness would be as if it was paired with whiteness or if there was a black character, they were black in skin color, but it was either they were full on, you know, stereotype or they're black in skin color, but their culture, their race, their everything has never existed. So I think <clears throat> this whole kind of push towards multiculturalism, which on the face of it seems positive, has actually have a, had a negative impact on the way that yeah, we're yeah. represented. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I agree. I wanted to just touch on sort of everybody's like industry. Um, so for me, I, I am in the a corporate sort of setting. So for me, it, I've always been the one of the, well, the only one, I think we've kind of progressed a little bit, um, but there's hardly really been much representation in, my, in the industry that I am in. Up until very recently, um, I was in the legal sector. And yeah, that sector is historically, you know, very white, middle class men you know sort of that kind of look and I never saw really anyone that looked like me if they did they were like either the cleaners or you know they were the security guard you know you walk into the building and you see uncle you say hi that was generally the representation um so I wanted to throw it out to you guys and just let what industries are we all in and what is it like for you so I'm in the housing industry so I work in social housing um and I'm, I've only been in the industry for about three years. I used to work in recruitment, which, and it's actually a stark difference. So in recruitment, it's quite a very, it's a very corporate space. So I was often one of the only black people um, in the office. And even being one of the few black people in the office was, was kind of tense because it was kind of like 
some people wanted to assimilate, some people wanted to be full on black and no one really knew how to kind of connect with each other. So it was a bit weird. It's kind of like everybody watching each other and trying to suss the other out. Um, and Tina was being a black woman and really the only other black people I saw were black men. That kind of dynamic was also a bit strange for me. Um, it just felt like, yeah, it was just a bit strange to put it that way. Um, in housing, there's a lot of black people. So it's very diverse, especially on the front line. But as you go up, as you can imagine, it's very white. So there's, you know, differences um, and challenges in that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's raised her hand? Nima? Oh, my hand wasn't raised. Was okay. it not raised? My bad, sorry. Sophie, your hand raised? Yeah, so I kind of wear various different hats in terms of like careers and where I sit. So I worked in the charity sector for six years of international development. And we were working in Africa, Southern Africa, majority and Asia. Um, but a lot of the people, when you go to the conferences of white people working in areas of developing countries where it's majority people of color, which always feels like it kind of grates because it's kind of like, this is how we get into problems this is how we get into issues when we're starting to relate to people who we have no link to and I'm not even saying that even I have a link because I'm not living in those cultures I don't know what their day-to-day -day life is and now going back to university and studying my master's in black British history academia is predominantly white there's like 25 black female professors of black British descent in the entire United Kingdom we make up 0.7 percent of professors as black people as a whole men and women within the wow. United Kingdom, out of 21,000, we make up 0.7%. So it's increasingly white. And those, and I think as someone else was saying, the further up you go with the pipeline, and I think that's where we're seeing people being weeded out because what, maybe they're not able to afford the PhD studies. Maybe they don't have people who have an in who can in, introduce them in those circles. So the representation is poor and even the barriers to get into it are also really prohibitive. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. Yeah, so um, at the moment, um, I work in advertising and it's pretty new. So, but prior to that, I was working in the railway and it's a bit different. It's not office dynamic, it's train dynamic now. So like, you, as much as you work by yourself for a while, when you go out outside of London and you go to other garages and other train stations and stuff like that, the, the more white it becomes, the more you leave London. So, for example, I used to, I used to get a train from Paddington to Cardiff. And as soon as you get to Reading, which is the next stop after Paddington, there's barely any black people that get on. And you have, once you get in there, you are kind of ostracized from all the other um, employees there and your colleagues and stuff like that. And then when it comes to management as well, because the thing about the railway is a lot of people um, are related. Everyone's from like this old boy kind of um, mentality. Everyone's brothers. You find whole families in the, in the railway. And often they're always white. <laughs> They're always from when times are very, very racist and so the rest of the family as they get younger everyone's racist as well you barely see black people in management um there are black people that are coming as conductors and they'll remain conductors for 30 years or cleaners and yeah i mean recently there's with the whole black lives matter stuff that happened they tried to um do a thing where they're going to promote black people i think over the whole railway, they were probably with like two, there's hundreds of people in, in the railway company. And yeah, so it's very racist in the railway. I could say, I could say very racist. <laughs> wow. Do, 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 have, do any of you feel, so in your different injuries and stuff, have you felt that you couldn't really be, not, I don't want to say be black, but be yourself? Like, cause I know for me, when I first got into like my first firm, like I found it very difficult to just be myself. Um, and you know, we speak a lot about code switching and, you know, I, I would I would really take time to think about my hair, for example, Like I would hate to have the conversations about, you know, one week I'd have braids and the next week, oh, did you cut your hair? And then you, the whole office then would focus on my hair. And I even had instances where people were touching my hair and oh does it hurt and because I was really young and new and you, you, you're the only one and you didn't want to seem like a I know a nuisance you kind of would just go along with it so I, I did feel early on in my career that I really couldn't be myself and it was almost like there was two versions of me the version at work where I would just go to work do my thing um you know I really didn't like going out for drinks and if I did go out for drinks I wouldn't drink because I wanted to be alert and I wanted to you know I can't be like you know Holly I can't be like her and get wasted and you know all that kind of stuff I think as I've gotten older 
I'm a bit more comfortable in who I am. But again, that's taken like, well, I'm like 34 now. So that's taken like, what, 10 years to kind of get to that point. So I'm going to throw it out to you. Um, I see you don't even have your hand up. How has that made you feel as a black woman in these spaces? Um, do you feel like you can be yourself? Um, I definitely feel similar to you. It's been a work in progress in my early 20s, definitely not. With my industry being well-being, um, I kind of straddled two sides. So with the yoga fitness, it's very a white space. And also with the well-being mental health, it's a very white space. And an example of this was um, during BLM. Um, I had a lot of conversations with colleagues where I kind of had to prove that BLM was not just a human rights or a, or, a, or a political issue, although it is those things, it also is a well-being issue and it has a big impact on our mental health as black people. Um, and that was like a fight I had kind of had to push through. And that's an example during that time, most of my friends, families and black colleagues and peers, we were affected by that, but we had to go, go to work and almost like unblack or tone it down or hide our real feelings or hide ourselves in that instance. And, you know, that is really difficult and sort of traumatic in itself and things like that we have to face on a sort of daily battle, really. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just move, I've see, I can see you guys hand up. I want to move the conversation on slightly along. So one of the areas that I wanted us to really touch on was um, UK politics. We all live in the UK. And one of the things that the Conservative government loves to talk about is how diverse their cabinet is. So we've got like, you know, Pretty Patel, Sean Bailey, Kemi Vanderdark, um, even on the Labour side, we've got David Lammy, we've got, um, you know, all, I mean, we have got black and brown MPs, right? So the reason why I'm bringing that up is, is representation enough, right? Because we, we could look at the government and say, actually, there is quite a few of us there, but if that position doesn't actually do anything to further the causes of the black community, what does representation actually mean then? So we need to kind of move away from, I guess, you know, the, the tokenism of representation and applaud it. And I think it's fine. You know, we saw in the US, you know, the first sort of like um, black Indian vice president, everybody's like, yeah, it's a win. And yeah, it is to some degree, but I mean, but we also had Barack Obama and it's like, well, what did, what did that achieve? So my question is, we need to move on from representation. So what is the next step? Anyone can go. Let's go to Nana. Do you know what? I feel like it's quite hard because as I said before, like black people are not monolith. And so like, for me, it's such a weird thing. Like obviously having black Tories cause I just look at them, at, at them and I'm just like, <laughs> these people are scary as hell. These people are, yeah. especially that Preeti Patel. She is frightening. Like I'm scared of that woman. So do you know? So I'm. I find it quite. It's quite conflicting for me. I think. And just to see, like, people who, because when we think about black people, that especially like pe people that came in the '60s, the '50s, and where they had to come from, like where they had to start from, basically the bottom, right? So it's like having these people that represent us that don't think like us, that's, that kind of have gotten, they're up now. So they, they, they've forgotten where they've come from, basically. It's, it's a hard thing to reconcile. I think it's a hard thing to sort of get used to. So with me, I just, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, was, I struggle with that a lot. I really struggle with that. I hear that. Yeah. I hear that. Go, go on. I think it's, um, I think the issue with the representation, representation that we have is that often they have had proximity to whiteness growing up. So because they have always either always had that proximity to whiteness and either always had that middle class background, always kind of had that privilege to a degree, even though it's representation, it's often not the right representation. It's often not, it's only representation of let's say 3% of us, I've just made up that statistic, for example. But if we think about black people as a whole in the UK, we are not all, the, the, the percentage of us that are middle class is quite small compared to white like, people that are middle class. So you've got all these middle and upper class people, black people and brown people representing us, but actually the majority of us are not middle class or working class. Do you see what I'm saying? So that representation technically is incorrect. So if you want to represent us correctly in those spaces, you are going to have to start allowing people who are from the class that represents us most 
However, we know that's not going to happen because being an MP is all about class. It's all about who you know and being from the correct schools and all of that kind of stuff. So it's a catch-22. I don't, I don't know personally how we fix it. It's a bit of a struggle because, I mean, we've just completed the census. So I think that will give us a more accurate view because with the conversation we had last week actually was that there is this disbelief that we make up 3%. Like most, a lot of people feel that, that that figure is inaccurate, that we must make up more of the UK. Um, so I think when the census results sort of are released, I think it will be a good to sort of see how we've moved on in the last 10 years and actually see, you know, where we sort of make up. And also class is, is an interesting one as well. Um, who had the head, was it Ro? Yeah, um, I think that with UK politics, we, we need people who don't just look like us. They need to actually represent yeah. us in our action, yeah. in our beliefs and you know, how we've grown up and all the rest of it like that. They need to represent, represent us in all our black type of ways, all brown type of ways, whatever that is. Mm. And um, just so that they can actually implement some sort of action and change. It's okay like seeing someone that's there, but if they're not doing anything for us, it's just, just no point. Because I remember um, that Diane Abbott is my local MP. And I remember being in primary school and there was this big thing, she was coming to our school and um, they, they really drove that she was the first black woman MP. And I remember coming home and acting like Beyonce was coming to my school, like, oh my gosh, she's famous, she's first black. Da, 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 da. And I just remember my mom rolling her eyes and, you know, she's like, yeah, she's first black woman, but I don't know, she's like, if she's got a son who's the same age as you, yeah, she's, she doesn't feel like the Hackney schools, the public schools are good enough for him like she's taking him to a private school yeah. and so to her it was like okay the representation is there is looking like it but um we have a child the same age isn't my child what is your child worthy the same education as my child and it just it provides this just this wall between you and your community you're supposed to be representing you have to you have to walk in the same shoes basically if you're gonna be in that sort of position I think now she you know she's trying to school now but but then in the 90s you know for my mom especially that that was somebody that she was looking at she's like no, no this is not it's not it's not right for me so yeah we just need the right people that are in there that are actually going to understand what we need to be changed and actually do we need some action mm -hmm. it's probably how people feel about David Lammy to be fair because, you know, David Lammy has been the MP for Tottenham for a very long time and mm. we all know, you know, what he's about. So I think for me, I think it's great to be able to look at a position and see someone that looks like you. But at the same time, I would much rather have somebody in that position who is actually going to implement the changes that will benefit me. That's right. And if that happens to be someone who doesn't look like me. Mm, I mean, yeah. you know, a lot of people really connected with Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn is the furthest thing from me <laughs> in terms yeah. of like, you know, representation. Yeah. But a lot of us did connect with him because yeah. he was saying all the right things. He cared about the things that we care about and doesn't look like any of us. So mm. I think it's very easy to get caught up in, you know, the spectacle of the first black this or the first this and actually realize that if their politics don't align with mine, Right. Because there are a lot of black people who are doing are in the forefront and are in the spotlight, but you know they are either sort of violently violently homophobic, they're violently transphobic, they're misogynistic, and it's like well because they're black we should just you know hop along with them. It doesn't make any sense. So I think we have to be careful not to get caught up in just how someone looks. Um, I do see your hands, but I want to move into sort of specifically looking at black women. Yeah. Um, and black women in the media. And do you feel that you are being accurately represented? Do you feel that, you know, because one particular industry I want to highlight is the, the natural hair industry. Now, that industry, I feel, is heavily dominated, or the face of it, they don't really look like me. Um, my hair will never look like that. Uh, my eyes will never look like that. Um, <laughs> Yet they are the face of, you know, loving yourself and, you know, wash and go. I can't wash and go. <laughs> I, can't do that. You know, I just can't do that. There's a whole market geared at manipulating our hair mm. to look a certain way. Now, is that something that worries you? Or actually, like Nana said earlier, we're not a monolith. So actually, there are black people that look like that. So how do you feel about how black women are being represented in the media. Anyone I think, yeah, I think um, this is 
my view across the whole representation topic. I think we have to move away. I personally say this all the time in my private circles. I don't talk about representation anymore. I don't talk about representation online. I don't talk about being black anywhere. I just exist. And I think we have to move away from representation and move into a space of values and promoting certain values in a society that is inclusive and acceptant of everybody. I think looking for one person to represent me is never going to happen because there's always going to be things about me that I'm never going to be comfortable leaving to someone else to come and shout for. So I think, and it ties back, back into everything we've been saying previously in that we're not comfortable in certain spaces. We don't have representation in politics. We don't have accurate representation in hair. And I think the reason for that is because we come from a society where the faster you shed your skin, the more you'll be accepted. And so the general consensus is the closer you can get to this particular race, the safer you will be. And that goes across everywhere. And it's because we don't have a society that promotes values of accepting people that are different, accepting people. Because now you see um, people with acne doing, you know, uh, skincare and love yourself and um, promoting different types of products. You see more people being put into the forefront of things that where they should have been to start with. And it's because we've erased them everywhere because we've said, this is how you have to be. And I think it also explains why in politics and in different types of you know, realms, people try to be a certain type of way because we are constantly taught, whichever, if you're middle class, lower class, working class, whatever, we're constantly taught, the faster you shed your skin, the better. And that's what's consistently driving everything, in, especially in the UK. Wow. Yeah, I, I yeah. completely agree with everything you said. Does anybody else want to add on to that? Wow. Yeah, I agree with um, just existing as well, because like obviously, yeah. even as a black um, gay woman as well, like a lot of times we're looking at representation, it just isn't going to happen, especially if we're looking at masculine presenting representation, a lot of times it's just not going to be there. So I, I do also agree with just existing, um, but I also agree that there is value in representation just because the younger version of me didn't see anyone like me out there. And yeah. because of that, you know, I came up to my mum and said I was trans because I just only saw guys that represented the way I did. And trans yeah. is not what I am, do you know what I mean? So. Yeah. I do think there's still value in it when people are finding themselves. If you're somebody who's already very comfortable with who they are and you don't feel like you need to look for anything for a um, representation, that's great, you know, that's great, you just exist kind of thing. But I still, I agree with just existing, but at the same time, I still see the value in representation. And just going back to this hair, natural hair thing you were saying, I just want to say like, when these labels of 4C hair and all this for- It's a scam. Hair, I just, nah. It's a scam. <laughs> I don't know why white man create that. It's a scam. Honestly, yeah. like, it's, it's just never. I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen your hand, Eldonia. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I, I also sort of, uh, you know, do align with existing in the space, but I think that having that positive representation can really have a strong ripple effect. So, for example, um, with me being in the well-being life coaching industry, I rarely come across other black coaches, they do exist in my day-to-day -day work. I don't come across them all black therapists. So I might work in an organization with 30 therapists where the majority of young people are, you know, people of color or service users of people of color, but they're never seeing black therapists. So the fact that there's not much representation means we're less likely to go into those industries, which means yeah. future generations are not gonna get support that aligns with them. So what happens to black people that need therapy, Muslim people, um, you know, people from all different backgrounds, the intersections that we've mentioned, uh, black people with disabilities, black people from the LGBT community. If we don't see the representation of us in healthcare, in well-being in these different fields, it's, it's going to impact negatively. It's going to ripple out to our communities, which it kind of already is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I do totally agree with the existing point. However, I do think that there are, like you guys said, there are instances where it's extremely important. I think for me, particularly as a dark skinned black woman, I think it is, it was very important for me growing up to see that we could be, that we could be beautiful, we could be desired. We weren't mm. always, you know, the, the loud, mouthy, gobby, you know, sidekick. And again, all of those characters are valid. Like they're not, mm. they should be shown, but I think, and especially since I became a mother as well, I think it was, it was more, I was more cognizant of how 
my daughter looked at me and, and sort of saw the first representation of a black woman. So and I've spoken about this quite extensively, like on the show and online about I started to wear wigs less as she got older um, because I don't know, like she just, I remember there was a day when she was, she put my wig on her head and I just thought, you know, it's cute and all the rest of it, but I thought, oh shit, like I don't want her to think that like, you know, straight mm. hair is, so I started to wear my natural hair more. And the first step was for me to start wearing my natural hair to work, never done that before. And I remember doing it up in a bun to work and I was so self-conscious and I thought to myself, wow, what a life we live in. Like I felt so self-conscious going to work. I felt naked, but mm. it was important that she could see that, you know, I liked my hair. Cause I don't, I don't know if any of you guys agree, but I don't genuinely, I don't believe that you can teach a child how to love their hair if they can't, if they don't see you do it. Um, so for me, it was really important for her to see that. Also, I mean, we won't get into it in this, in this, in this conversation, but colorism is something that many of us have come across and deal with. And I think in order to teach children how to love their skin, you have to be proactive about that because no one sat us down and said, dark skin is ugly. It was, it was slow and it was subtle and it was in the things you watch. So for me, having that representation for my daughter is important. So all her books, I don't have white people in her books. Like all her books are black people, black hair, black girls, the art in her room, it's black girls. Because I'm just like, well, why was it okay for us to have white dolls? Like, you know, and people look at me like, oh, I'm, I'm being extra. I'm like, well, yeah, why? Like nobody would blink an eye in the 90s if they were given a white doll but it's funny that I give her a black doll. So Simone, I'm gonna go to you. Yeah, um, I was just gonna piggyback off what you were saying actually. And I um, I actually think the children that are growing up in this time now are actually really blessed in fact, in terms of representation, because we really do have so much, like you have the ability to go and buy the books, to go and buy the dolls, to give her the artwork. And we really didn't have that growing up. So I think going forward, our generations I believe personally are going to do a lot better than we did because they do have the representation and actually it's it's becoming more so even like when you spoke about what does representation look like for us as as black women like your platform here this platform right now for me we're so fortunate that I could I don't need to watch mainstream tv to see me anymore I can go online I can log into this kind of show and it's like okay there's there's women that actually represent me and represent my circle so I think we're, we're we've moved forward but we haven't necessarily moved forward in the mainstream and I think to be fair it's okay let's stop asking them to open the doors for us because actually we've actually got the talent to create our own and now is the time to really actually stop asking him master to let us through the back door of all the big mainstream tv you know it was like oh if i can get onto such and such i won't mention them oh i've made it really no they've made it because they're using your talent and i think it's now time that we as black not just black women black people stop asking them to represent us and represent ourselves create for ourselves this is a platform that can grow and be humongous if only we as the black women and the black people that were out there you're doing it for supported it so this is how much do you want to actually how much are you going to support what's out there for you yeah, please support us. <laughs> 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 like, seriously, like, yeah. you know, people, you've got people that, you know, people will log in to watch, I don't know, my kids watch this, like, I don't know, like all these American shows and they watch this, binge watch these series. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But actually, I want to support local homegrown because why can't you just be as big as the mainstream TV? Why? Why can't we? Mm -hmm. yes. this is what we're crying out for so now you've provided us with that let's use it mm -hmm. I agree, well, very well said, I agree I'm going to go um, to Nana and then Mariam and then Sophie yeah no I, I agree 100% because the reason why me and Rosie we began on YouTube first was because we didn't see any black masculine British like lesbians and we thought we have to do this now. Like you, like you would say, oh, we don't see enough of this. We don't see enough of this. And then people reply, why don't you create it? Why don't you start it? And then you're like, oh, no, let's do that. Do you know what I'm saying? Because 
there isn't enough so it's like you're gonna have to put yourself out there like and that's just what we've had to do and I feel like you know we every any time we have to go into different spaces white spaces we have to compromise ourselves we have to compromise our blackness it's in the same way in the way we code switch I, I used to work in IT and I was at the end of the day I was exhausted from fake laughing like laughing at those jokes I was tired do you know what I'm saying like it was it is a thing and it's tiring it's exhausting and it is about creating your own table like don't wait to be asked to have, have a seat at their table create your own table and that's right. what we, we we we've been doing and I'm started I've moved from IT and I'm going into film and that is so like the film industry is so white and so clicky and like some sort of secret world that you know people don't want to let you into and the black people that are already there because there aren't enough spaces they don't really want to give up their spaces do you know what I'm saying they don't want to give up, give up their spaces um and it's because there aren't enough spaces but it's about creating more spaces mm-hmm. but can I sorry sorry to no, no, sorry it's not even that they need to give up their space we need to remove ourselves from the scarcity mentality and actually you know what yes. just put that just put the ladder down just put Thank the ladder you. down exactly I don't need you to give up your space babe because guess mm-hmm. what Nana I can't be you you can't be me mm-hmm. but I can say you know what Nana come in because this is what yeah. it looks like and as soon as certain people get in there, they just close the door behind yeah, them. Yeah. And because that's what they I've been just seeing. and it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, just don't that? just don't block me. Just don't block me. Like that's you, 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 don't, block, yeah. don't block me. But yes. I mean, we could have a whole conversation about how what, when that happens. That is a but, whole you know. other, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll go to Mary and then <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. I completely agree with everything that you guys just said um, in terms of, you know, the scarcity mentality. That is a whole other conversation in and among itself. Um, I do think, though, as a community, we have a bit more of a responsibility, though, in the terms of what we are reacting to and what kind of things we are consuming. Because if we think about it, supply and demand, right? that we have things like these in these spaces there is representation out here we have been doing black campus for goodness knows how long we have there are other things like the grapevine that even in the uk there's heels off there do you know what I mean? there's so many great platforms it with full of black women who are talking about really important things and having very important conversations but you know that those platforms do not get as much attention they are not as they don't get clicked as much and so sometimes it feels like well actually what do you want because you're screaming for all this all of this representation you're screaming for all of this different media but you're not engaging with it when it actually comes and is in your face so at what point who is that really at blame here? Because really and truly, if the BBC and the Channel 4 and the people that we're asking to let us in, if they're making the stuff and we are consuming it at, you know, high ends, do you know what I mean? If, if they're making these things and all of these things that we're talking about, but they're not representing us and they're not all of this, but, and they're dramatic and they only represent us in one way, if that's all that we're consuming, if that's all that sells, that's all they're going to keep supplying. So mm-hmm. as much as we can, you know, keep talking about yeah, creating our own spaces and doing all that kind of stuff, we have to look at what are we actually consuming and what do we enjoy? Because we all do enjoy a little bit of drama. But if that's all we're mass consuming, that's all that they're going to keep making mass, they're all going to keep mass producing. So I think it's just something to think about. It's mm-hmm. a great point, Sophie. I think it needs to be multidimensional when we're talking about representation as well. So I don't think it's just the, the just the grassroots model or the online model. I think it should be everything. Everyone needs to be working at all the different levels because as much as um, I can watch things online or I do content for online, like if we know that the mass media is promoting something, it's going to have more eyes. That's the way that we're going to read, reach a wider demographic of people. And I understand, I definitely think create your own table, be part of other tables. But I think when we have this idea of them letting us in rather than actually, no, we just belong there. If we are society and we want it to be representative society, we belong there. And so when you see people like Issa Rae who started out online, but she was able to build her platform to get online. And now she's like, okay, I'm gonna open up the birth. I'm gonna let more talent in. I'm gonna work on different platforms. Shonda Rhine even though I might not like everything that she does she's moving from Netflix to TV to this to that because like we need to now now diversify where we are because the issue is that 
if we're not the people making the content or having control over it at production level, that's why we see a scarcity of things done in the 90s. Because when it's seen not to be in anymore, then there's like, oh, it's not in. And then all the white decision makers are saying it's not in. But when people are starting to progress and get to the level of, I'm the one making decisions about what goes on television now, then that's when we're going to see it. So I think we need to be working on every level. So some people want to work only online. Some people want to go into film and work in that industry. It's going to have to take all of it for it to be more diverse and to have more representation. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that, that's a really good point. I think somebody mentioned earlier about that at one point there was only sort of one type of thing that we were seeing on, on, on mainstream TV. Um, you know, some of this seemed to be this sort of love affair with like, you know, gangs and, you know, people would be like, oh my God, another gang, blah, blah, blah. But do you think that sometimes, and also there are certain platforms that I won't mention that people, you know, you'll see online and people will just be like, oh, you know, why do we always have to have these six form level conversations and blah, blah, blah. But do you think a lot of that is sometimes born out of respectability politics? Like actually like we can have the sort of like mind dumbing, like what's wrong with having mind numbing, you know, content? What's wrong with us being ratchet on, you know, love and hip? Like what's wrong with all of that? It's almost as if like, we're like, oh no, we shouldn't really be doing that. And, but then we want to like be like, we should be having more intellectual conversations. But there's like, why can't we do it all? Do you know what I mean? So sometimes I feel like, you no, know, not just as black women, but we, you know, we are in a bit of a chokehold with respectability politics without really, under, really realizing it a lot. Um, I see your hand, Nana. I'll go to you and then I'll come to you, Ro. Do you know what? I feel like it's because we're stereotyped so much and it's always negative that, you know, when we see that representation, it's sort of, sort of like PTSD, like, we, we, we can't like we can't have that because that's not all we are and that's true but also think of like I've been watching Shameless recently and that is like underclass white you know white people and is there do you know what I'm saying so I feel I feel like we should be afforded the same opportunity like I, I feel like even with the you know Black Lives Matter and you know everything that was happening in America and it was like well this guy, if he just, if he just, you know, didn't resist or, you know, he was a um, ex-convict and stuff like that. It's just always, it's always the case. Like there's no reason, there's absolutely no reason for a person to be treated uh, badly. There's just no reason for it, but there's always an excuse when it comes to black people. And I feel like that it's just like, as a community, we don't want to be attached to all those negative stereotypes. And we see it on TV or in the media. We just, it's just something that we just hate, I think generally. Well, there's a whole there's a whole platform that is dedicated to like you know fighting the stereotype and you know I am not my hoodie like all that <laughs> kind of like oh I'm so sorry I'm just gonna take a moment I really hate that movement I just the find shade. like he's just <laughs> tap dancing to white people pandering oh look I'm wearing a suit I'm not like the other blacks like that's just that's what I see when I see that movement that is mm -hmm. like you know Do you it is what it is and, but that's what it is. It's oh, I have a degree, or you know, I, I have a degree and I wear a hoodie. So who cares? Like who actually cares? So yeah, I just had to. I just had to have that little moment, Ro. Yeah, I'm just going to say. To, um, just, just to add on to that point. Oh, oh, go on, go on quickly. Oh. No, 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 no. Girl, you start okay, thinking. Cool. I just want to say there's, there isn't anything wrong with having like ratchet content. Everyone loves a bit of ratchet content. But I think what the problem is, is that people love outrage. People just like reacting to things a lot of times and it's gonna be reacting to the outrageous things. So that's why we get more outrage provoking content out there because they know that's what's gonna get them the clicks and you know push them forward and stuff like that. And for me, I just think that, um, yeah, they, people just love a bit outrage. If you look at Amaya Brave and um, any, for example, the Georgia Smith stuff and the Black Girls, was it Peng Black Girls um, song, for example, since then, any and Amaya have released music, very good music, but it's not getting the clicks because it's not the outrage, it's not outrage like it was in the first place, you know? So I do think that sometimes the audience is also the issue. It's not always necessarily about the type of representation that they're putting out there. People are just going to click on what they know is going to get them the clicks. And right now, the, the reactions from the outrageous reaction is what gets the click. So that's what people do. But I don't think that means anyone else shouldn't put out, you know, actual productive content. Like we need more productive content. People are going to click on it. You know, even if it's like 300 people, imagine 300 people inside the room, that's still a lot of people that's going to mm -hmm. click on your content. So I definitely think um, I like the variety, mm -hmm. but sometimes the audience is definitely the issue. Have you and Nana ever felt the pressure maybe to try and be a bit more, you know, 
controversial because we know that or you know have you ever felt that pressure because we know that you know mm -hmm. you can oh, you can you can go viral overnight because something you edit it in a certain way or you know we all correct on so we know that the tactics that you mm -hmm. can do to try and get more um engagement so have you guys ever felt the pressure to do that no um no and actually not really I think that we because we speak about ourselves and our experiences you know me personally I have a nine-year-old she knows I have a podcast <laughs> and like I need to speak about my experiences in the way that I want I don't mind her like hearing about it like obviously this we talk about sex and stuff like that we don't want to hear that don't want to hear about it right now right now you can't be clicking on that but um at the same time that that power my family view me how my kid especially my child views me is more important than getting these clicks so um and also we we one thing about us we're always very honest with what we put out there what, how what how we present ourselves and things that we say and we just nah sometimes we do feel like in the title when we put out there it needs to be a bit clickbaity that's the only thing I would say but how what we actually put out there I wouldn't say we've tried to compromise in that way mm -hmm. no we just try to be honest and that's that's it yeah I mean I've always got that from you guys anyway I just thought I'd ask if <laughs> yeah but I've always got that from you guys. Like for me it's just me being a, the age I'm at I'm more concerned about you know it feeling authentic and being able to to relate on that level yeah of course I don't mind clicking on something every now and again that you know gets us going but generally I want to watch something that I feel like is authentic and um, Mary I'm sorry you wanted to say something um, it was just, if it's like the hoodies, uh, the hoodie argument that you, I know you hate it. I know we had a very heated discussion in our group chat about it. Um, but it's funny enough, I, I was talking to my dad who was, who, who mentioned it funny enough a couple of weeks ago. And I think the way that he felt about it was the way that they intended it to be. And I think sometimes similar to, you know, this respectability politic thing that we do, we also kind of forget that we throw out this like tap dancing trope a lot. And it's like, we forget that there were people here before us who felt that that was the only way to get, you know, acceptance. And it's sometimes, as much as we can sit here and say, do you know what, you shouldn't be doing that. We should just be able to exist and da da da. They come from a time when actually, I need you to know that I'm human. I really do need you to know like why my survival depends on it. Do you know what I mean? So they are still in that survival mode, unfortunately. And so that's why they still feel the need to like, quote unquote, tap dance, if that makes sense. So I'm always saying that sometimes that generation just needs to like, you know, grow old and mm -hmm. leave us with grace <laughs> because <laughs> Some of them are not old, but I'll just throw it out there. Some of them are. Yeah. Some of them aren't old. No, no, no. I give <laughs> grace at a certain a generation. Everybody after the age, I don't give that same grace. But I feel that like there is certain people we do have to give some grace to because they still exist and they're still very much have a say in our society. Mm -hmm. So we just have to be mindful. But yeah, not all of them are old and not all of them are like that. It's not, it's not one size fits all. Yeah. So yeah. Um, go to Sophie and then Mildonia. And I, I really feel the respectability politics as someone who is Christian and comes from a Christian background because, well, I guess Christianity, when you think about it, I'm from Caribbean descent, but it was all given of this idea as how to make you respectable, how you're supposed to act properly. Mm. And it's something that as I've gotten older, I've had to break down within myself because I remember when I watched them, I May Destroy You we're by Michaela Caldwell, mm. which I loved, but I was just like, she's so messy oh my gosh she's so messy like people are just gonna fit and then I thought to myself why can't we be messy why can't we be this why can't we be all these different things and I think sometimes there's this idea in respectability politics of putting your best foot forward because you're like like we're saying there's representation but when you're the pimp or the gangster or the this or that you're just like we don't want to be seen as just that that speaks to some people, but it doesn't speak to everybody. But I think it just needs to be more because like little Nas came out with the video of Montario um, yesterday and people are just like, this is the representation we've been needing to see like queer people in this sort of way. And some people hate it, but I'm like, we just need to see more and more and more because otherwise I think respectability politics, I think we can kill our older generations for it, but I think it's so 
it's so much goes in the cycle of things that we complain about with older generations because younger generations are going to come for us as well. Everyone tries to do the best in the generation that they're at. They do the best thing that they think is going to help them to survive, to get ahead, to be themselves. And when I see my nieces now who are like 15 wearing their natural hair to school, I'm like, man, I remember when I was 12 and I got my first relaxer and I was like, yeah, I'm getting big now. Like that, that was the natural step. You go to secondary school, you got your hair relaxed. Mm -hmm. And now to see that it's changing and they're younger being told to accept themselves. I'm hoping that they won't have to have that period of work where should I wear my straight hair to the interview and then my natural hair, hopefully it gets better and better, but it's all just a continuation and everybody trying to stand on the shoulders of forebearers to try and see what does it mean to be black and to accept myself. Yeah, oh, wow, that is very well said. And I, I completely agree with what you said. I think my main, unlike you, I've had to do the work as well in breaking that down because I grew up in a, a very Christian home where, you know, there were just certain things that were, you were just indoctrinated to a certain degree. Um, even the video we saw quite recently of, um, what's that weirdo's name, the Jackson guy and his wife, you know, the, the helmet of salvation or whatever. Oh, Derek, Derek Jackson. Derek Jackson. Like, yeah, <laughs> the stuff Jackson. she was saying, as uncomfortable as it was, is a lot of stuff we hear in church. Do you know what I mean? I was listening to it and as much as she made me cringe, I was just like, rah, like, this is not, this is not un unfamiliar to me. And you have to do that work within you. My main reason why I have a problem with that movement is because I feel like it panders to white people. I think it's fine if you want to present yourself a certain way because it makes you feel good. But I think if you're doing it because you want, you're basically begging people to see your humanity and as if that somehow makes, it's going to make you better than the next black person or, you know, racists are going to be racist. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I don't feel like it's our job to change who we are fundamentally for them to see our humanity. That's my problem with that whole movement. Again, I could go all day, on all day about that, but yeah, I completely agree with you. We're gonna have to start rounding up. So I'm gonna go to Nim and then Lildonia. My bad, I was muted, sorry. <laughs> That's <all right. laughs> okay. A clubhouse reaction there. Um, yeah, so I wanted to say that a lot of I think we underestimate and I'm not gonna let me not speak for everybody so I'm just speak for myself I think I underestimate just how much clothing is politicized in these um in these days and but for black people and for everyone in general because you're speaking about the the hoodie movement and I'm also remembering like a conversation I had with my dad where he went to my brother and he was like why are you dressed like that and my brother was in like traditional Muslim clothes which is like um he was wearing the dress basically and my dad was like why are you wearing the dress like you don't need to wear the dress to be muslim da, 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 da. and he had this like long conversation and it was just basically because you know like the connotations around that and your best defense um your best offense in this society is a good defense you have to step out with your best foot forward as you guys have said and my dad did not want my brother going out being ready to be ambushed because you know if he takes it off he's gonna look like a black guy which gives him one less level you know it gives him one more level of protection right if he looks like a muslim guy they might just treat him differently and i think when i think about like clothing and i think about how much people like trayvon martin i believe got killed because he was in a hoodie right i think about how much of our clothing has already been politicized in the fact that if a group of black boys was walking towards me as black as i am and they all had their hoodies up, i would naturally be guarded they're not doing anything wrong so i do think that we do have to pander to an extent for our humanity because we've already seen just existence still gets us killed so there has to be some level of i'm not going to do it but if someone else wants to start begging and pandering and doing whatever and it's and it's to protect my blackness then i'm going to let them do it because i already know there's there's already a lot of things that I have to fight. And I think about a conversation I also had with my friend where he was just like, you're always in flight or fight mode. And he didn't understand why. And then we sat down and we broke it down. And it was just because with my intersections, there's always something for me to defend. If I'm not defending blackness, I'm defending being a woman. I'm defending being a Muslim. Um, being Muslim, like you very rarely get the chance to just put it all down. And so when you're in that position, I feel like everything we have is 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 the armor or our weapons or whatever we have to protect ourselves we have to just ride with it even if it's not pretty even if it's ratchet even if it's whatever it is and when i say i don't want to talk about representation it's not like i don't want to see representation i want to talk about values because i find that a lot of the reasons why i can't exist in any space is because people aren't willing to accept me for who i am and that's something 
that's to do with the cultural values in this country where if you don't drink like you're speaking about going to the pub if you don't drink if you don't like I have to you know take five minutes to pray sometimes it's literally five minutes and sometimes I can do it in three right but the moment I do it the room gets awkward everyone's staring at me they want to ask me random questions and it's just like you just need to face your forward and go on with your day but it's because we don't give people room to just do what they need to do that we just have so much of this like you know awkward uncomfortability and there's just so like existing is just so difficult as is so yeah <laughs> that was extremely well said and i agree i do i do see your point i do there are definitely some uncomfortable things we have to do to be able to just navigate life you know it's half sane so i completely understand i mean there are things that i've done growing up you look back and because you know better you think oh why did I do that but at the time I needed to survive and I completely get that I think survival is important as black women and again all those various intersections that we have there are there are different things you're going to face you know depending on who you are um so I, yeah so I I think that was a really great point to make thank you um go to Lordonia yeah um and just picking up on a few of the threads that we've mentioned just circling back a bit to what Sophie mentioned about um needing to have representation in all different spaces with our own media with mainstream media um and just sort of bring it back during this last year I had lots of conversations about representation as we probably all did and I had um colleagues and neighbors and friends who were white asking me things like um but why is it that black people are always killing each other? But why is it there's no such thing as a black middle class? And I'm really having to unpick those stereotypes and I choose to because I'm happy to have those conversations. And the reason why are because these are because these are black uh, white people that have never engaged with black people on a day to day level. Um, they're policy makers, nurses working in parliament and their only imagery of blackness is what they see in the mainstream media. And that and that's why sometimes when I'm watching those shows, I do have that cringe as well, where I'm like, oh, I can't see another, I can't see, not because I don't feel it represents me and my communities, because I know that's what's being promoted and spread across the people who ultimately are gonna have a big impact on black and brown communities because they are people in positions of power and authority. Um, and so, yeah, I just think it's really important that we sort of do hit it from all of those various angles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a really good point. Does anybody have any final thoughts before we start to close? Simone? Oh, I'm muted. Um, I just wanted to really touch on what something that, um, the last lady mentioned. And I'm tired of actually having to educate these people with respect. And I respect that you want to, you're happy to do that. But I'm actually tired of constantly being the voice of blackness wherever I go. I don't know why people are killing people on the road, because guess what? I've never done it. I don't, there's so many things I just don't know. So I can't answer that because I'm not going to ask somebody about a topic they know nothing. Why do I assume they know something about it? And recently, this is my final thing. Um, Listening to all of you, by the way, I just feel so honoured to be here because actually I feel quite emotional because it's really tiring now. And in my workplace, one of the consultants asked me, why do I think slaves were taken from Africa and brought to America as opposed to brought to England because the 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 geographical location was actually closer. Now, that was all in the, I want to learn, like umbrella. And I just looked at him for all of like two minutes, cause you know, you've got a choice to make as, as, as black women, let's just be real. You know, we've got the fire, we've all got it. So mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, do I unleash my fire now and just end my career? Or do I just play dumb and walk away? And this is constantly what we have to do. So this is why me personally, I'm not going to educate them because I don't necessarily think they all want to be educated. I think it's the, it's the right thing to say at the moment. So I, I don't know. I hope, that black, I hope that white people are actually watching this and are actually checking themselves and asking, why do I want to know what I'm trying to find out? 
you know and is there a better way of going is there a better route to go and find this stuff out as opposed to thinking every black person you meet knows the answer because we don't know the answer we don't know why we're suppressed we don't know why you guys don't want to give us a seat at your table we have an inkling as to why but we don't know why actually you tell me why mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's, it's similar to what um david kalua said isn't it when he was just mm. like you're asking me for like it's we we are assumed to have the answers to all life's yeah. mysteries about why racism exists you know why why you know i i feel uncomfortable doing this or doing that you know why does white supremacy exist like why does white privilege exist um many of us at the stage we are at in our lives didn't happen overnight we had to do the work you know we speak a lot about people being woke but then you don't just become that overnight you have to be very proactive about unlearning certain things because also as black women there are a lot of things that you know we are conditioned to do and to believe right, right. so many of us are now very comfortable in who we are as women, right? Mm -hmm. But you didn't get to that point. And there are still some things about me as a black woman that I am quite uncomfortable with. And that's at 34, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine being 24, imagine being 14. You have to be- I still, got it. I still got it at 42. Right, like, exactly. It doesn't, go. Still, it doesn't really go away, but you do get mm -hmm. to a point where you feel a lot more comfortable about yeah, certain things, accept. right? Yeah. But I had to be very, proactive with how I learned certain things so mm -hmm. I did the work right I read books right I, I watched shows like another an, an area that I have been a lot more interested in over the last couple of years um is the queer community right because yeah. there were a lot of stuff growing up in a very sort of black Christian dominated like household that you just you just think and you believe but also since I've had a child as well I remember having a conversation with somebody on on Twitter saying how do you assume that your child is going to be heterosexual? We just assume it. But then actually, I've never really thought about the fact that actually I could have children that might be trans. I might have children that could be gay, right? Don't know if any of you watch This Is Us. Yeah, do what Yeah. yeah Remember the it. episode where love Tess it. came out? I cried at that episode. I was like, yeah, oh, geez, she if cried. that ever happens to me, please let that be the way I handle it. Because I just thought it was, it was beautiful, right? But again, yeah. I'm not queer. So I have yeah. to make the choice to yeah. learn. So I apply the same principles to white people and to men, right? If mm -hmm. I can go and be proactive about learning about something that is outside of my space, yeah. you can do the same, right? And mm -hmm. you know, if I do have questions, fine, I can ask certain people, but I still will go and do the work. So I think as black women, and we've seen it quite a lot on things like, you know, social media, like Clubhouse, where there will be these rooms of black women, you know, really taking on like very traumatic sort of, um, topics to educate people. And I think to myself, what is this really doing for your mental health? Like, should we really be doing this as mm -hmm. black women? A lot of the time when it comes to um, campaigning and protesting and being a voice, black women are always at the forefront all the time yeah i'm not saying mm -hmm. we need to, i'm not saying that we shouldn't be but i'm asking the question that why is it always why is it always us you know why is it always us that you know are the ones that are almost like acting as a shield you know the, the armor of salvation like why is it always us <laughs> at the forefront <laughs> not that that to educate black men and you know <laughs> black men are like there's always every time on clubhouse there's a room about black men don't love us all the time all the, it's the most fake, all the time. You know, why don't black men love us? How do black men, oh, asking black women, how do we protect you? Like, I don't know how you guys feel about stuff like that, but like- I think it's, it's all rubbish. It's just all bullshit. Thank like, you, honestly, it's nonsense. Clubhouse, Clubhouse, it's all bullshit. Like, honestly, put Clubhouse down. Been so angry the past few months, like put down the cake, put it down. Nobody sent you, nobody asked you, no one gave you the cake. No one said, this is your job. Why are you screaming into the abyss, into your microphone on Clubhouse? Who are you helping here? And like, even if we bring it down a notch and I'm frustrated, even if it's as much that you would like to help, even if as much that you genuinely want to educate people, you have to think about your own personal mental state before you do that, because I'm sorry, unfortunately you're engaging in conversations that are triggering, but unfortunately those conversations 
are going to have to be triggering. They're going to be uncomfortable. So if you're not in the space to deal with that, don't have the conversation. It's not, it's not down to somebody else to not trigger you. It's you not to enter spaces and in, inviting people to invite to say their triggering opinions into your life and then crying because you're triggered and then screaming and re-triggering. Like, can we not see the cycle? It doesn't make any sense. And it's like, the people that should be running these conversations, i.e. the people that have done the work and are comfortable and aware and are, you know, relatively grounded, are not the people that are, have the clout to have the conversations. So here we are having these conversations that, you know, I guess needs to be had with the wrong people having them. So really, what are we solving? Mm. Yeah. Right? Yeah, just one more thing. I just want to say, especially as black women, we need to recognize when people are misunderstanding, they're just committed to misunderstanding. We have to recognize when that's happening and just protect our peace in that moment and move on. Because a lot of what they're asking you is probably on Google for free anyway. So like you need to value your time and your emotion when you are expressing yourselves and just stressing yourself to make someone understand. But if that person is committed to misunderstanding, just walk away. Like, as black women, we have to protect ourselves and they a lot of people out there are not there to protect us, so we have to protect ourselves, and it starts with our mental health. Like, you know, yeah. the best people that we are for ourselves, for our families mm -hmm. or children, or just whatever, we have to be in a correct state of mind, and you shouldn't allow other people who are just misunderstanding, just committed to misunderstanding, to get into that negative place, especially mm -hmm. Google. Like, just yeah. send them to Google. If it's, it's a thing where, like last night, for example, this um, an old friend of mine was asking about hormone blockers, and, the whole that realized with the whole conversation he did he wasn't hearing what I was saying he just wanted to say that it was wrong to give to kids and in the end I realized that he just thought that it was that was the first step in transitioning he just felt like it's so, we need to give them hormone blockers it means you started trans transitioning and I told him you know kids who start puberty early are given hormone blockers mm, because yeah. you can't have like seven year olds run around the playground the period, yeah yeah we're not without them understanding or people who young children's bones who that don't develop properly they're also given hormone blockers too and there's no outrage so when he and i said to him you need to okay go and google i realized this conversation wasn't going anywhere go and google what hormone blockers are don't come back to me because i'm done with the conversation <laughs> thank you very much good night and that was that yes, I'm married, I'm little lamb. absolutely and protect ourselves. You protected your peace. It's just like, yeah. you know, sweetheart. Um, so we're going to round up to so the last three now, Nana, Sophie, and then Simone, and then we will round up. I really think about, I think it's about how much capacity you have. Like you can, it's, it's, of course it's up to you. Like, but I really feel like, especially with strangers on the internet, for me, it's a no. I am not going to explain anything to strangers on the internet. Like I'm not doing it. I'd rather explain things to people that I actually know. And, you know, like the other day, um, a guy that I know, he was like, oh, because we're going to work together. He was like, oh, can I be homophobic? And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what? He needed your permission? Can, yeah, he asked my permission because he was just like, I don't like, I don't mind girls be together. But like when it comes to guys, I just think it's wrong. And I was just like, I had time for him. I had time for him, do you know what I'm saying? I actually had the time and I was feeling love. So I was just like, I'm gonna give this guy love. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I feel like really truly love can't cause all. So that's that's just where I'm, I come from. So I was just like, I just had to ask him like, why do you feel like that? And we had a conversation and I was just like, no, you cannot be homophobic because this is like, I would never allow that. I have a podcast <laughs> that talks about this stuff. Like it's all about having integrity. I would never ever allow that. And it was just like, I had time for him. But there's some people I don't have time for, mm -hmm. and I will not, you know, I don't have that mental capacity for. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's about, you know, as Rosie said, you have to really, really think about what you can take on and what you can't, and you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, wow. I was going to say that I just really felt when um, Nim was talking about the pain of experience experience and the intersexualities not because they're painful but because of the way that people react to them mm -hmm. um, and the way that people treat her because of it and I think it just comes right down to why I just really want to have representation because it shouldn't be that hard for all of us to go through life like we all have various things as people of color I saw the thing happen with Sarah Everin and for me as 
I guess there's people who are a bit, <clears throat> people a bit older in black. I don't know. I don't know what old is. We're still young, but you know what I mean. And seeing white people react to it being like, I can't believe it, it could have been me. And I'm just like, she's white. I can still relate and still feel like it could have been me. But when I heard a woman talking about, she now has to talk to her son who's white and he's six foot and she feels it's so unfair that she has to have this conversation with him. I was just like, you know, <laughs> at six years old, the black boy is no longer seen as a child. He's seen as a threat. We're having conversations a lot longer that we just have to have to get through the world. So. I really wanted to be like, miss me with that. But it's kind of like, that's why the representation is so important because people people just don't get it. And we need to be able to see ourselves in all these different facets. And I don't even think it's about people um, consciously trying to act for representation because if you're queer, if you're black and disabled, if you're black and Muslim, when you come to write something or present something, you're already coming with that perspective because it's your lived, it's your lived life. I'm not trying to represent um, a queer woman I am queer so therefore when I write I come with that lens I come with that angle it's about people just being different in the room because they're already going to bring it in without us trying to feel like I'm trying to push an agenda because as we're saying I'm just existing this is how I see when I see um, a same-sex couple when I see someone who's disabled I automatically feel their pain because I, I, I represent that I live that experience so yeah I don't want life to be this heavy. That's why we need representation. I shouldn't only have to feel safe and be black in my house when at the family barbecue, at the wedding, I can be myself. I need to have that everywhere. And that starts with seeing myself everywhere. Yeah. Thank you. And now final final thoughts from Simone. Me? Was, was, it was, you? was it you? I'm sure you had your hand up. Was it not you? The hand is always up. Um, I was, I was, <laughs> bring us, just bring us home. <laughs> So, um, you know what, it's just my final thing really from a personal perspective, I'm no longer going to make myself uncomfortable to make people comfortable, just not going to do it. So whatever that looks like, I know no more, it's, it's yeah, not going to happen. I love that. I love yeah. that. Thank you for that. And yeah. Nana, final, final, your hand is up. No, it's not. No worries, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. And that final thought from Simone about, um, I'm no longer gonna make myself feel uncomfortable for others. I think that is something that I personally now live by. I think we, as we said earlier, as black women, there are definitely some familiar things that we all share as a collective, as black women, but then there are also, again, we spoke about the different intersections um, that exist and it's all valid. Um, for me, as a black woman and having representation, I do think it's important. I do think it's valid. Um, but I also think it's also equally valid to say that we shouldn't get caught up in, you know, the tokenism or of what it looks like. Mo first and foremost, as Nim said, it really is about the values and about, you know, what somebody stands for. And if somebody who doesn't look like me is able to push things that will um, benefit me as a black woman, I will always support that. Obviously, first and foremost, I'm always rooting for everybody black, but we also have to acknowledge that, you know, not always, not skin, not all skin folk are kin folk, unfortunately. There are some people within our community, you know, who can be violent and who can cause harm to us. But I think it's important, particularly for children, for them to see themselves and um, for them to be able to grow up with a pride in who they are all right everyone so that is the end of this episode i just want to thank all of the ladies for joining us today it, it means a lot to us that women are taking time out of their sunday morning to join us so thank you so much and to all of you watching at home what do you think about representation? We've spoken a lot today about what it means, but I think sort of the key things that I want to bring out is that representation isn't enough. Um, it's nice to be able to look at an industry or, you know, look at someone and be able to see yourself and be able to identify with them. But I think it's also equally important that their values align with yours. Um, and that's the key thing that we um, have discussed today. We've also spoken about how important representation is for children. As a mother, I know how important it is for me, for my daughter to be able to see me and embrace my natural hair, for me to also really reaffirm her with her skin, you know, making sure that she understands that she's beautiful. And I do that through books and things that she watches and, you know, affirmations and stuff like that. I think we definitely have come a long way when it comes to representation. There is a diverse amount of content out there that we are able 
to connect with. So like to use two podcasts, they exist because they saw that there was a gap. So I think that as much as we want to be able to see ourselves in mainstream, there are a lot of grassroots that are happening online and we just need to connect with them. We just need to support them because like we said, we're not a monolith, right? We aren't. There are so many different interests that we all have and I'm pretty sure that if you look for it, you will find it. So thank you guys for watching. Made it to the end. Well done. Um, if you're not following us on all of our socials, they will be on the screen now. Please do follow and continue the conversation online. Use the hashtag Black Canvas TV and we will see you guys in another episode. Take care. Bye.